Saskatchewan. Start somewhere inside its borders, pick a direction, and you can drive for hours without ever leaving. A land as vast and varied as its rich history. It doesn't matter where you begin or where you end. It doesn't matter if you're moving or standing still. The place will come to you. It will whisper to you. It will tell you stories. It's a place full of stories. Stories of culture, stories of survival, stories of accomplishment, and stories of people. It will capture your imagination. It will become a part of you. It will move you. Beginnings. Everyone and everything has a beginning. Sometimes the exact moment is difficult to pinpoint, but it's always there. And after the beginning, there's always more. An intangible something pushing the story forward. If you look close enough, you'll find new beginnings all over the place. In this place, Saskatchewan, it all began on September 4th, 1905. Saskatchewan's boundaries are completely artificial, and in fact, our model should be Saskatchewan, easy to draw, hard to spell. Before Saskatchewan became a province, it was just one district of the Northwest Territory, which also included Athabasca, Alberta, and Assiniboia. The creation of the province of Saskatchewan and Alberta in 1905 was a consequence of Minister of the Interior Clifford Sifton and the federal government in encouraging immigration and settlement in the Northwest Territories. As the population of the Northwest Territory grew, so did the demand for services. The territorial government lacked adequate financial resources. The drive for provincial status was mostly driven by the need for more money. A province could borrow money, the territorial government could not. Frederick Haltain, the Northwest Territory's first and only premier, began to lobby for provincial status in the 1890s. Haltain wanted one large western province to be named Buffalo. He wanted this new province to have control over its public lands and resources, and this is what he pushed for. But the districts could not agree on Haltain's vision for a single western province. And in the provisional district of Alberta especially, there was a strong sense that if and when provincial status was granted to the Northwest Territories, Alberta should be a separate province. The federal government, led by Sir Wilfrid Laurier, followed popular opinion, and on September 1st, 1905, the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta were created. They were the eighth and ninth provinces to enter the Dominion. On September the 4th, 1905, the Prime Minister, the Governor General, a number of other prominent Canadians assembled in Regina to inaugurate the new province of Saskatchewan. The first order of business for the new province of Saskatchewan was to appoint a premier and choose a capital city. Both tasks proved controversial. Frederick Haltain was our first and only territorial premier. A lot of people believed that he should have been Saskatchewan's first premier, but because he fought provincehood with Laurie, because he was so insistent on one province, and because he had proved to be such a thorn on the side of the Laurie government, he was deliberately passed by by Laurie. He was deliberately snubbed. In fact, they call it the greatest snub in, in Saskatchewan political history. The honor of becoming Saskatchewan's first premier went to Regina newspaperman and Liberal MP Walter Scott. Scott had decided to name Regina as Saskatchewan's capital city, but several urban centers were lobbying to be chosen. And in fact, the lobbying by Saskatoon was so intense that when Walter Scott took a straw vote within his caucus, the night before the official vote was to be taken, he found to his horror that most of his caucus preferred Saskatoon over Regina. He instructed his caucus that Regina was to be the choice of capital, so the next day when it was put to a vote, Regina did succeed and was made the permanent capital. Ontario-born Walter Scott, the first Premier of Saskatchewan, moved out west in 1885. His first job on the prairies was with a newspaper in Portage the Prairie. 
interestingly enough, he had uh, a grade 8 education in terms of formal schooling, but he was a very well-read man and a tremendous writer. The press was Scott's contact to the public and proved to be an effective platform for his launch into politics. Walter Scott at one point was writing to people saying, we need to buy a newspaper in this particular town or that particular town because they need the Liberal voice. Scott's affinity for the Liberal Party led him to become more than just a supporter. He was elected to the House of Commons from 1900 to 1904. In 1905, he was selected provincial leader of the Liberal Party and subsequently held the office of Premier until 1916. During that time, Scott saw the province's population grow exponentially. He had the grand vision of what this province would be. He predicted that this province would likely have 10 to 15 million people by about 1925. By 1925, we were the third largest populated province after Ontario and Quebec at just under a million people. And interestingly enough, that's still about where we are today. You look at the size of the legislative building, for example, we had only a little less than a quarter of a million people, 250,000, and yet a building that is still the largest legislative building in Canada. The University of Saskatchewan here in Saskatoon is still only covering about half of the land that was, was purchased. And so they were building not only for 10 years or 50 years, but for actually for centuries. Scott was also instrumental in the decision to create the College of Agriculture. Scott very much believed that agriculture was the backbone of this province and that that was no disgrace at all. The University of Saskatchewan, for example, was the first university ever to have a College of Agriculture incorporated as part of the university so that the farmers would be studying next to the nurses and the doctors and the teachers and the lawyers. Scott also led his government to establish the rural municipality system. This gave farmers access to services such as schools and telephone lines. He wanted to make sure that the people would stay on the farm and not be attracted to the lights of the big city. And one of the ways would be for them to have a telephone. It was a cooperative system whereby farmers would join together with the assistance of government and they would uh, put in the lines themselves and they had a phone system uh, throughout the rural part of the province that would be one of the legacies of the Scott government. Also of concern to Scott was the issue of women's suffrage. It was during Scott's reign as Premier that women obtained the right to vote. Walter Scott left politics in 1916 and died in 1938. He was 71 years old. Scott said, this is a big land with big people, with big ideas. And I think that symbolizes and sums up who Walter Scott was. From something imperfect comes the beginning of something better. A better way of doing things, a better way of thinking, a better way of being. So it was for the pioneers who came before us. For Violet McNaughton and Sophia Dixon, a better way meant a new way, another new beginning. A little tiny woman that came from England and saw the difficulty, lived the difficulties of rural life and was able to, in her own way, be the start of a lot of things. Violet McNaughton was born in 1879 and eventually settled in Saskatchewan in 1909. Violet was a farm woman, suffragette, a longtime writer for the Western producer, and an early advocate of Medicare. Violet was born in Kent, England. She decided that she wanted to come to Canada where her father and her brother lived, just outside of Harris. Nine months later, she married a neighbor, John McNaughton. Working closely with her husband, Violet noticed the plight of the people in the area and set out to give them a voice. She decided that she had to do something for rural farmers, rural people, and rural women, and thought that being in on the grain growers with the people who were homesteading and farming, that was the way that she could make a difference. In 1913, she became the first woman delegate in the Saskatchewan Grain Growers Association. But she didn't stop there. Her activism with the grain growers helped to establish the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool. Her ties with the grain growers allowed Violet to achieve higher goals. She united the women's grain growers with other women's groups, and together they helped in the fight that led to the women's vote. Violet also noticed the lack of medical care for rural people, especially women, and campaigned for better medical services. 
she took on the role of women's editor for the Western Producer. The newspaper featured discussions on issues such as birth control and safe water not found in other places. She also used her position as editor to maintain her contacts with progressive women and quietly exerted a great deal of influence. She became involved at international events as well and was often sent as a delegate. In 1934, she was given the order of the British Empire from the King of England for working with rural people. In 1997, Violet Clara McNaughton was designated a person of national historic significance. There was nothing put on about her. She was just simply interested in making life better. She was not a person who sat quietly at meetings. She had things to say and she got up and moved motions and seconded motions and complained when things didn't go her way. Rural activist Sophia Dixon was born in 1900 in Denmark and moved with her family to Saskatchewan when she was 11 years old. She joined the International League for Peace and Freedom, a women's organization formed during World War I. Dixon was also concerned for the well-being of rural women she became involved in the women's section of the Grain Growers Association. Dixon began writing for the Western Producer, where she proposed many of her ideas for reform. She wrote about the need for world peace. She said she didn't raise her children to be cannon fodder. She wrote about grain prices and uh, the problems farmers were having. She wrote about uh, the need for better education for rural people. Dixon believed passionately in the need for improved health care. She was one of the active people in what was called the State Hospital and Medical League here in Saskatchewan. It deserves a fair bit of credit in the founding of Medicare in Saskatchewan. One health issue that Sophia promoted generated a great deal of controversy. She was a great supporter of birth control at a time when it was illegal to advocate birth control. But Sophia thought it was ridiculous that women on the prairie should be raising 10, 12, 14 children and having to feed the family as well and she thought they should also be involved in organizations to better their lot and uh, they couldn't do that when they were looking after that crowd of children. Dixon also devoted energy to the creation and operation of many other organizations. She helped organize the Unity Cooperative Association and the Unity Credit Union. Then she got involved with what was called the United Farmers of Canada Saskatchewan section. In 1933 was elected president of the women's section of that organization. 1933 was also the year that the CCF, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, was organized. Sophia was quite involved in the drafting of the Regina Manifesto. Dixon's work for the cooperative movement and rural women's organizations earned her the Governor General's Persons Award in 1979. She pushed the idea of women getting involved in politics, in community work, and developing the organizations that were going to be of assistance to farmers and, and their wives. Beginning a new life in a new land is a story well known by many Saskatchewan families. For many, their story began in Saskatchewan three or four generations ago. Grandparents and great-grandparents came from distant lands. They came looking for a better life. They came for a more prosperous life. For others, they came simply to live. In Saskatchewan, the human rights enjoyed by many were in fact not a right at all for others. For others, for others, they came to escape hardship, prejudice and persecution. In 1938, a part of Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, was ceded to Nazi Germany. Many social democratic Sudetens found themselves at odds with the new regime. A local Czech Nazi party got formed and some people uh, went with that flow and others were opponents and my father was one of these political types that was pretty violently opposed and so by about 1938 uh, life got a little unbearable so he went on the run. Like many other Sudetans, the Leiter family fled their homeland. Between April and June of 1939, 150 Sudeten families and 27 bachelors arrived virtually penniless in Saskatchewan. They had narrowly escaped the war in Europe and were embarking on a different challenge in their new home. We had no idea about Saskatchewan or anything else. 
Canada was going to settle us in the cheapest land available, which was land that nobody else could use anymore. Only the things that had failed or raw bush was where we got dumped. The Sudetans were settled in St. Walberg, Loon Lake, and Good Soil. The Canadian government chose these regions in part because many other German immigrants had previously settled there. A lot of the people of this community spoke German. But on the other hand, nobody likes to talk about that these days, but there were a lot of Nazi sympathizers here. So uh, in that context, it wasn't uh, all just peaches and cream. Even though relations between the new settlers and their predecessors didn't start out as expected, sharing life in Saskatchewan had a way of wearing down the differences. Whether it's Ukrainian or German or Czech or Austrian or British or whoever, ultimately they became neighbors. We were all experiencing the same winters, the same weather, the same hardships, the same bush, the same cold. It's a great leveler. Homesteading was not suited for all of the Sudetans, and after the war, many of them started yet another new life. Most of the folks pulled stakes and moved to the city. They went back looking for work in the areas of expertise. My old man thought that the sun rose and set on Saskatchewan and Canada. I think we're prouder to be Canadian than people who take it for granted. My great-grandmother, who was born in 1876, she it was actually born into slavery, even though slavery had ended several years before. In fact, there was one whole town that was just owned by black people that the white people burned them out. In the early 1900s, Saskatchewan attracted immigrants from all over the world. Among the people who settled here were African Americans driven across the 49th parallel by racism. Another reason for the immigration north was the promise of free land. One black settlement was founded by Julius Caesar Lane in central Saskatchewan. My great-grandfather settled just north of Maidstone, Saskatchewan in 1909 and went back down to Oklahoma during the winter and several other families made arrangements to come north to Canada and settle in the Maidstone area as well. So there was about 12 families who came up in the spring of 1910. Soon after they arrived, the pioneers built the Shiloh Baptist Church. When they set up their own settlements and stuff, the first thing they would build after their homes would be a church. Then the church would serve as a meeting house, a community hall, a school. It served all those functions. Another tradition the Shiloh people brought with them left a legacy on the prairie landscape. The Shiloh Cemetery has several large spruce trees. In the old days, after a person died and they put a rock at their head and put it the grave, they plant a tree right on the grave. These spruce trees you can actually see from miles away. There's no other spruce trees hardly in the area. The Shiloh community eventually became home to over 50 families. Further growth was impeded by incidents of racism. The front page headlines about being overtaken by blacks. And by 1912, 1913, the outcry against this immigration uh, became so strident that the government took active measures to actually discourage the immigration. Despite prejudices, the African American settlers eventually became a part of Saskatchewan's social fabric. Over the years, you know, the white people began to accept the blacks and, of course, many friendships evolved and, on the whole, I think the black community were fairly happy. I still get asked today, where did you come from? Not realizing that I, I could be born in, in Canada and that my father could be born in Canada. Some beginnings began before there was anything at all. An idea and an ideal carried in the hearts of men and women before the province was even born. Ideas which spawned plans, plans which spawned hopes, hopes which crashed up against reality. And out of disappointment and hardship, hope reborn. From such beginnings emerged something wonderful, something unusual. Straddling the South Saskatchewan River, people who carried a pioneer spirit into the middle of the 20th century built Saskatoon, gave her a fine university, gave her industry, gave her spirit and grace. As far as where the name Saskatoon comes from, the word is Saskatoon, and it refers to either the berries, the Saskatoon berries, or to the place where the berries are harvested. The settlement of Saskatoon resulted from a change in land policy by the Canadian government. John A. Macdonald's government said we've got to get the West settled. 
as quickly as possible. And just opening the land up to homesteaders wasn't working. So in 1881, I guess it was, they reworked the legislation to allow for colonization companies. One of the companies formed was the Temperance Colonization Society, a group of Methodists from Toronto who wanted to create a society free from alcohol. In 1882, John Lake led a scouting party for the Temperance Society. He found a location for what would become Saskatoon on the banks of the South Saskatchewan River. The colony was established in 1883, but attracting settlers proved to be difficult for a number of reasons. The nearest railroad was in Moose Jaw, more than 160 miles away, and then in 1885, the Northwest Rebellion broke out. The Eastern papers played the rebellion up in such sensational terms that it actually frightened people away. People were on their way to Saskatoon and changed their minds. They don't know, I don't want to live there, it's too dangerous. And in fact, the rebellion passed Saskatoon totally by. Finally, in 1890, the railway arrived, but it was located across the river from the temperance colony. They finally built a railway through Saskatoon. That was very important. Probably without the railroad, Saskatoon would have withered and died. Two settlements grew quickly on the west side of the river. One was centered on the new railroad station. The other, called Riversdale, grew up just west of the railway tracks. The temperance colony began to flounder. One of the problems was that they were only allowed to take every second section of land. What this meant was that within the colonization society area, there were all sorts of land that they didn't control and anybody could homestead. So that whole temperance thing just didn't work. Right? You can't do that if half the people don't have the same sort of moral goal or obligation as you do. On November 16, 1901, the settlement around the railroad station, which consisted of 26 houses and a population of 113, incorporated as a village and took the name Saskatoon. So the people on the east side of the original colony got their noses a little out of joint at this, and so they picked the name Mutana, which was supposedly an old Indian word meaning firstborn, but it seems more likely that it's just Saskatoon backwards. But Saskatoon backwards is New Taxes. Right? No one wants to live in a place called New Taxes, so they shortened it farther and called it Nutana. Eventually, the three villages, Saskatoon, Nutana, and Riversdale, found that working together could be more profitable. In May 1906, Saskatoon, Nutana, and Riversdale amalgamated, and on July 1st, the city of Saskatoon was born. By 1908, four bridges crossed the South Saskatchewan River, making Saskatoon a major transportation hub for both rail and road traffic. The population skyrocketed to 28,000 by 1912, just the beginning for a city that today boasts more than a quarter of a million people. In the beginning is a name, a single word that identifies a person, place, or thing. Sometimes a name sticks, and sometimes it doesn't, because sometimes the thing we name has a mind of its own. Well, we've had five name changes. I don't know of any other town that changed their name so often. The small town of Prudhoe, located just northeast of Saskatoon, has undergone many different incarnations since it was first established by Joseph and Anilka Marcotte in 1897. The Marcottes were the first settlers to arrive here with their cattle, and they settled on the ranch in the area where Prudhomme is today. And there was a lot of little blue flowers on the land, so they called it Bluebell Ranch. The second name was Marcotte's Crossing because the railway came through in 1905 and it crossed across the Marcotte's land, so they called it Marcotte's Crossing. And then in 1903, they had a daughter that was born and they called her Lolly. They were quite proud of the fact that she was the first child to be born in the area, so they called the place Lolly Siding. Thus far, the names for the area had been unofficial, but as more settlers arrived, the little hamlet would undergo yet another name change. They wanted a new name for the post office, so they took the name of a barrister and surveyor that was in the area. He was also the lawyer of the Marcots, so they used the name Howell. The name of Howell did not sit well with the predominantly French community. There were many heated discussions about what the town should in fact be called. Like Saint Hélène, because Hélène de Joie was the woman whose money built this church and built the rectory that is now the museum and she was helping all the farmers around to buy land, so they wanted to honor her. Others wanted it Marcotteville because the Marcottes were the first ones here. And the hassle went on over weeks and over months and over years even. 
Unbeknownst to the residents, the local doctor made a move to officially change the town's name without their consent. Dr. Lavoie took it upon himself to stop the hassle and he wrote to Ottawa and asked to have the name changed to Prudhomme because Prudhomme was the name of the newly appointed bishop in the PA diocese of which we were a part of at the time. Apparently, a letter was all that was needed to name a town. In 1923, the townspeople were informed that their town was now officially called Prudhomme. That's all it took. The Dr. Lavoie disappeared overnight because he knew he'd have problems, so he left. Even though the townspeople had been hoodwinked by the good doctor, there was now a formal name for the town, and it has stuck ever since. Stories always start with a beginning. In September 1905, Saskatchewan began, but the story didn't end there. The story became something more than anything anyone ever imagined. The story became a place to live, a place where many came to live. They began a legacy, a legacy which spawned a future for generations to come.